Same x-ray and, and everyone had a different opinion on how it, what was going to get taken care of. Nails, plates, supine, lateral, pro, prone, whatever it is. Uh, and then at least to, uh, to learn from everybody, but, but each person sort of from a debate style being assigned one thing and this is why you would do and what you need to do and to try to convince the audience of that. Um, did they hand, I didn't see, did they hand out the clickers? Yep, so I hope if you guys don't now maybe discreetly get out, you'll get a, a little clicker up front because at the end of uh, each section here we'll have a um, little contest to see what, what the, if the speakers did a good job or what, uh, what the audience would do. So uh, to begin, we have uh, Dr. Matulo with uh, RAF of a clavicle fracture. Okay, thank you very much for having me again. Uh, my job is to discuss displacement shaft clavicle fractures with the side of open reduction internal fixation. Uh-oh, got a spinning wheel. There we go. So here's the original x-ray, and, and the first thing we need to notice is this is a mid-shaft clavicular fracture. We've got some shortening. We've got some displacement with uh, a sort of inferior displacement of the distal portion, and there's this little segmental portion as well that you may or may not appreciate uh, showing some comminution. So... You know, back in the day, I was, I was taught in early residency that if two ends of the clavicle are near each other, they should heal uh, as long as they're within the same room. However, uh, while that treatment paradigm existed in the past, what we're realizing is if they heal, and they don't always heal, they don't always heal with good satisfaction or with good outcomes. I think the first study that came across since we're in an evidence-based medicine uh, parameter these days is looking at the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, sort of the landmark article from JBJS in 2007, looking at uh, randomized multi-center uh, mid-shaft clavicular fractures, and they found that surgery is definitely better in terms of constant scores and disability scores of the arm uh, uh, and shoulder. Uh, and hand. Healing is 16.4 weeks compared to 28.4 weeks, which for your patients who work make a big deal. Non-unions were significantly less in your operative group at 2 versus 7. Symptomatic non or malunions, 0 in your operative group versus 9 in your uh, conservatively managed group. And your operative patients were more satisfied with function and cosmesis. So if you want patients that do better, heal quicker, get back to work faster, you have less workers' compensation forms to fill out, less disability disability forms to fill out, less malunions to deal with, we should start to consider surgery. Well, surgery is effective, uh, but does it cost more? And in today's new and unknown realm of what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act, uh, you know, surgery costs money. Is it cost effective to operate on these? Well, two studies, one in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, 2010, cost effectiveness of open reduction internal fixation after acute clavicle fractures dependent on the durability of functional advantage. So when functional benefits persist for more than nine years, ORF had a favorable value. So our patient's a young individual. I'm going to assume that she's going to benefit for more than nine years with my intervention uh, as opposed to a 90-year-old. So we're definitely going to say that it's cost effective. What about the journal Shoulder Elbow Surgery 2013? This is what they came up with with their cost effectiveness. It's a little busy, but less chronic pain, less deformity, less weakness, less loss of motion, fewer non-unions, missed fewer days of work, less assistance at home, mean income loss was significantly less, only $321 compared to $10,000 for surgery versus non-op management. The emergency department bill was a little bit higher, uh, but the mean hospital bill, uh, again, a little bit higher. Therapy cost was less. They required less pain medication because they healed faster. And overall, the cost for operative intervention was $12,976 and change versus $18,000 for non-op intervention. So it's still cost effective. Well, we always look at, again, uh, papers and evidence-based medicine. Here comes the Cochrane Review. They like to look at everything and put together their opinion. Uh, and they basically summed up their uh, uh, review in clinical orthopedics and related research. To date, all the randomized trials have found that 15 to 20 percent of patients develop non-union with non-operative management, and that malunions are common with that approach, in contrast to nearly consistent achievement of a union and low frequency of major complications with operative treatment. So Cochrane and their review has also backed this particular statement. Are malunions problems? Sure are. They can cause that dreaded thoracic outlet syndrome and brachial plexus compressions. 
The approach in terms of, of doing this, fairly simple, and I'll put that in quotes, subcutaneous bone, easily palpable. You have a, uh, lots of positions that you can basically put these patients in. Other studies that I can mention here, uh, Hill study with closed treatment of displaced fractures, McKee study, NOAC study, again, backing us up that the operative approach is absolutely the way to go in 2016 with our data and our outcomes measurements. So when you think about it, just do it. You see these fractures, they're there, all right? Put a plate on them, fix them, make them better, get them back to work, get them healthy, get them healed, back to activities. It costs less for the patient, it costs less for you, it costs less for society, and it's just the thing to do. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the chance to talk. It's hard to follow that up. Um, it's pretty compelling, and I'm speaking to an audience of surgeons or surgeons in training, and, and so I'm kind of presenting the anti-argument here. But I'm standing in the same place that uh, a fellow named Dr. Sarmiento stood, I think, three years ago, kind of question, what are we doing about all the, with all these surgeries? And he's saying, we're becoming plastic surgeons of the musculoskeletal system, and that term has kind of stuck with me because yes, we can kind of measure these fine things. Maybe they get back to work a little quicker, maybe they look a little better, but are we really helping them and are we giving them surgeries they don't need? And uh, we saw some cost data, but we didn't see the cost data of complications and what do we do with complications and um, second surgeries? I think about 25% of these people get second surgeries. And for some cases, the surgical indication is clear. If somebody has an open clavicle or horribly displaced, maybe a floating shoulder, we fix those, but then we see a whole bunch of these, including this case that, that we're discussing, that to me kind of fall into a gray zone, and should we fix all these? And, and yeah, there's some data, it's short-term data, and uh, we also had data about knee arthroscopy not too long ago, and, and we were doing all these knee arthroscopies, but we probably did knee arthroscopy on hundreds of thousands of people over the last few decades with degenerative arthritis in their knee that had no real benefit from these arthroscopies, and are we reliving that now with clavicles? Are we re reliving that with distal radius fractures? Are we reliving that with, um, Can you use the keyboard? Yeah, keyboard. Um, are we re reliving that with these other um, sort of gray zone fractures? And there are a lot of pressures on us to operate right now. There's a cultural pressure to operate, and not just from the physician side, but patients. More is better, more studies, more surgery, more treatment, more therapy. So there's a cultural pressure to do more. And, and there are outliers too. We treat the outliers in our country. We would rather operate on 100 people because a couple might not do well. Europe has a different approach. They say, Let's take care of 100 people non-surgically, and then we'll operate on the ones that aren't doing well. So we have a, a bias in our country to treat the individuals and the outliers rather than the population. There are financial pressures to operate on these things too. Our procedures are incentivized. We're incentivized to operate rather than take care of people non-surgically. And now they're increasing competitive pressures in the market where we may say, we think we should do non-surgical care, and the person's going to go down the street and somebody's going to look at this and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they didn't operate on you. They're committing malpractice over at Cooper. They should be operating on this. They don't care about you. They're not giving you what you deserve. So there are competitive market pressures. And I think inherently there's an action bias. When somebody comes to us, we want to do something for them. And I think it's harder to do nothing and say, we're going to take care of this non-surgically. We're going to give this some time. Rather, there's an action bias to do something, to operate, to give them an injection, to order a study, to order therapy, to order an MRI. So all these things are driving us to do procedures on people, and I think people are getting surgeries that they don't need right now. Uh, and as I said before, this is applying to all these things. I'm seeing this happen in just about every single one of these, geriatric distal radius fractures, humeral shaft fractures, metacarpal fractures, pelvis fractures that are non-displaced, tibial plateau fractures, shaft fractures, fibula fractures. And I wish I could just replay the talk that Dr. Sarmiento gave a few years ago because I'm trying to reiterate the same kind of things that he was saying then. Um, and if a problem happens, if somebody gets a non-union, if somebody gets a malunion, we can fix those things, particularly with the clavicle. And the very surgeons that were writing the articles about saying surgical care also wrote some of the same articles that said we can take care of non-unions perfectly fine. There's a Belgium article that says if it goes on to a non-union, we can take care of this with surgery. And these surgeries don't need bone grafts anymore. Malunions we can fix. Corrective osteotomies without bone graft. So the morbidity is low, so you're giving them one surgery that they may not have needed anyways. And the same patients up in Canada that were studied 10 years ago, there was a recent paper in 2014 that said maybe we didn't really capture all the complications that were happening. This was published in 2014 in uh, JBJS. And they looked at 1,300 patients in Canada that had surgeries on their clavicles, and one out of four had a reoperation. And the most common reason for, was for implant removal, 18.8%. So one in five 
had uh, removal of these implants that are symptomatic. And how do you capture the data on numbness, infection, these things that happen in the office? So there are costs that aren't being captured in some of these outcome studies that you saw reported. So in summary, I think we need to resist our perhaps unhealthy urge to operate on all these sort of gray zone mid-shaft mid clavicle fractures, and I would include this as one. I think we need to resist cultural, financial, market, and these biases to operate and understand the complications, the second operations that are often follow along these first operations. And in many of the discussions about ORIF and upper extremity, I say this is a two-stage operation, one to put the hardware in and a good chance to take the, sec the hardware out, whether it's clavicle, distal radius, hand. Um, I doubt this argument that I'm putting forward will stand because, like I said, we're in a room full of surgeons, and so we're on the financial side of this, and we're incentivized to do this. There's this bias to do this or market pressures to do it. Even patients are demanding that we do it. Lance Armstrong got his fix. Why aren't I getting my fix? And so until we feel the financial burden of this and the patients start to feel some of the financial burden of this, I think we'll continue to see this drift into surgical care for all these sort of gray zone injuries. Thank you. All right, everyone's got their clickers. So after our discussions, there's the 32-year-old female, occasional bicyclist, the bicycle enthusiast, non-dominant upper extremity. Uh, so we'll do uh, RAF versus non-operative treatment. Looks like we're collecting our scores. And is there, a, is there a timer option there somehow? There you go. Should we break up the banks? Should we consolidate? Raise minimal? Oh, wow. Different response to the spread than, than yesterday. All right, but it looks like uh, the majority say uh, ORAF, but uh, so, yeah, it sounds like uh, Dr. Dr. Fuller is uh, eroding away. So it's a, it's a state by state contest, so we'll move on to the next state. So, speaking, uh, here we go, moving on to the next state. We're going to have uh, 